The Master Tavern Keeper's History of the Old World. Anyway, back to the invasion of the Norsei at the dawn of the Empire of Sigmar. Once again, Cormac Bloodaxe hearkened to the advice of his shaman and limited the scope of his raids in order to spread and instill fear in the population of the rest of the Empire. But, although he may have limited the number of raids he engaged in, he in no way limited the butchery and slaughter of his men. Soon, Tales of countless Udosi's warriors, hacked up like dead fish, and women and children impaled upon barbed stakes, spread like a plague through the taverns, inns, and village markets of the Empire, and a wave of terror washed over Sigmar's realm. The stories of Cormac's victories over both the Rotson and the coastal ports and villages of the Udosi's also filtered back up north, penetrating as far as the Karyos wastes. Here, in those cold climes, it had the opposite effect on the listeners. The tales drew more and more northern tribes to Cormac, and even some of the Kurgan and Hung in the wastes, hearing of the Norse king's favour with the dark gods, journeyed to join in the slaughter, eager to wet their axes in the southern weaklings. However, all this done, Mere raiding was not enough to quench Cormac's thirst for revenge, and his next act was to utterly disembowel the Udoses. He began by launching a vicious, lightning-fast raid upon the town of Haugorvik, slaying and sacrificing all within its boundaries. The Ropsmen, too, were pressed into participating in the fight, and, alongside the Norsai, butchered the men, women and children of the Udoses. This act, however, sealed their fate, as you will see. Cormac's horde then moved onto the castle of Salzenhus. This time, there was no salvation for its occupants. The ancient keep fell, and its inhabitants were killed to a man. This included King Wulfilla himself, as well as his pregnant queen and the rest of the royal family of the clan. An example was made of each. The queen had her throat slit. Wolfilla was crucified, and the others were burnt alive upon a huge pyre to the Norsai's dark gods. This broke the back of the remaining Eudoses, who descended into infighting, and opened up the rest of the empire to the Norsai. The Norsai wasted no time. Their armies once more went on the march, putting swathes of townships to the torch and innumerable throats to the blade. Sigmar too moved quickly, but his wrath first fell upon what he perceived were the traitors in their midst, the Ropsmen. When Sigmar heard of what had befallen the Eudoses and the cruel fate of Wulfilla, darkness cast a shadow over his heart and the Emperor gathered a mighty host of warriors to avenge their deaths. The tale of the butchery the Eudoses had suffered been told and retold so often that the truth had become clouded. The crimes of the Ropsmen were magnified beyond all credibility, yet it was believed in those times, fear having utterly riven the land. Sigmar marched east and put every single Ropsman settlement to the torch. At the Battle of Roskova alone, it is claimed that in excess of 3,000 Ropsman clansmen were killed without mercy nor quarter. Twice more, Sigmar brought the scattered Ropsman warriors to battle, and each time the slaughter was 
unconscionable. At last, the few remaining ropsmen fled, reaching the River Linksk. The last hundred ropsmen warriors tried their best to impose some order on their people's flight across the river, but panic had taken hold of the survivors. They would not wait until the ice had fully hardened over the river and began to cross. A portion of the ice gave way, and dozens were plunged into the freezing depths. None returned to the surface. The heartbreaking scene was witnessed by the pursuing army of Sigmar and the Odoses, but they were unmoved. By this point, less than a thousand Rotsmen survived. Sigmar's genocidal rage had brought the people to the edge of extinction, but hate still held the king in its embrace, and he was poised to finish the bloody work. Unable to stand idly by any longer, Sigmar's old friend, Pengrad, came to him and desperately tried to reason with the Emperor. Where sense could not penetrate, the love and friendship of Pengrad pierced through the red veil and Sigmar's mask of vengeance cracked. Realisation dawned on him and tears streamed down his cheeks. He let go of his rage and allowed the survivors to flee. The last of the Ropsmen were mostly women and children and they headed to the northern lands beyond the river. They were a broken people though, dealt a blow from which they would never truly recover. They lived for centuries within the hostile lands of troll country, uneasily coexisting with the Ungols to the east, before eventually being able to recover a modicum of their past strength and carefully expand southwards along the coast of the Sea of Claws. Ah, uh, it is no wonder that this story is not recorded in the history books. It is a stain upon the Empire. Hmm, indeed. We will come back to the Ropsmen in a moment, though. Before I tell you of their final fate, let us finish the story of the Norse invasion of Cormac Bloodaxe. After the defeat of the Ropsmen, Sigmar brought his battered army to bear against the real threat, the Norsei. But his war-weary men fared no better than the Udoses, and eventually they ended up retreating back to the city of Midnheim with Cormac and his blood-crazed followers in hot pursuit. The Norsei besieged the city for 12 long, bloody days, and the besiegers filled a deep pit outside the city walls with the corpses of their enemies, crimson offerings in honour of their foul god. The slaughter drew out the beastmen and their kin from the forests, and the ranks of the enemies that faced the defenders of Midnheim swelled. Cormac Bloodaxe had but to wait and starve out the city in order to secure his victory, but that was not his way. He threw his army again and again against the walls of Midnheim, with he himself ever at the fore, screaming for slaughter like it had never been seen before. And these were no mere words. He very much led by example, and his own axe was thick with congealed blood from dawn till dusk. On the thirteenth day, Cormac was awoken by a violent vision from his deity, Carnath. He commanded the fiercest warriors of the eight clans to immolate themselves at the pit of the dead in his honour, in order to uh, bloodily kowtow his god's favour. It worked. The blood god accepted his libation, snatched up the Norsei king and reforged him anew as a raw manifestation of rage and anger. A foul, blood-thirsting demon prince. Cormac, in his new, powerful form, strode forth to the city walls of Midnheim and cleaved them in two with but a single blow. He slaughtered hundreds with his burning axe, and his presence alone drove many men mad with fear-induced rage. Inevitably, the demon prince crossed blades with Sigmar, and the two fought to decide the fate of humanity in the old world. 
However, the blessings and aid of the god Ulrich were upon Sigmar, and he was able to defeat Cormac and banish him back to the realm of chaos. The Norse sagas were uh, somewhat vague on this defeat, though, as could be expected, I suppose. Anyway, after this, the Norse army retreated in disarray back to their wolf ships and returned to Norska. I shall return to the full tale of Sigmar Heldenhammer another day and offer greater insights into this and the other key events in his life. But we'll do that when we have uh, more time. My apologies, Heinrich. Ah, no, no, Master Tavernkeeper, you do not need to apologize. It is I who should be apologizing to you and the uh, young neophytes. Ah, no, 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 there's no need. It is I who have interjected far too often and for far too long. Right then, neophytes. And so, finally, we can now get back to the story of Vegir, the sacrificer, whilst he was still abroad on the Sea of Claws. After finding the coastlines of Nordland and Ostland too well defended to attack any more, Vegir decided to take a leaf out of the book of Cormac Bloodaxe and recruit the Ropsman to his cause. With this in mind, he journeyed east along the Sea of Claws until he finally reached the land where the Ropsman now lived. Here he beached his ships and prepared to move inland and attack and subjugate the Ropsman, just as his hero had done centuries earlier. However, these were not the tribe that they had once been. They knew their history, and they knew the Norse. The Norse had become a shadow that loomed over the Ropsman, as uh, perhaps this old lullaby of theirs pays testament to. Slumber now, child of mine, until they come with torch of flame. But do not run, your time has come, for the men of the North stake claim. They come to claim, child of mine, they come to claim your life. With hearts of stone and splitting bone, their wake is deadly strife. So sleep tonight, child of mine, for tomorrow morn the sun won't shine. So stay aware and often prayer, for the men of the North march time. But there were many in the tribe who would not live in fear and had used the years spent in troll country to harden them. Wieran, the king of the Ropsmen, wielded his small but tough fighting force like an assassin's dagger and was ever watchful for his people's nemesis. They had also seen the effectiveness of war machines against the Norse and it was with these that the Ropsmen welcomed Vegir and his men as they prepared to attack. Fighting was soon joined. Primitive bolt throwers assailed the charging marauders, impelling many of the Norse upon long barbed spears. As melee was joined, the Ropsmen released captured trolls into the rear of the hordes of invaders and each killed a dozen men before being felled. As the combatants fought on, other war machines were brought into position and, from the cliffs overlooking the beach, these catapults hurled boulders at the beach ships, scuttling each, apart from Vegir's kingship, which lay out of reach. The fighting was fierce between the Ropsmen and their ancient foes, but they were able to force the Norse back to their vessels. Here, Vegir saw the damage that had been wrought upon his ships and realised that he had been outmaneuvered. He and his Huskirls irreverently fought their way through their own men to reach his ship and heave it back into the sea, even as his bondsmen fell to the increasingly fervent blade work of the dispossessed clansmen on the beach. More rocks were hurled from the clifftops, and these landed in amongst the Norse, slaying the bunched up warriors in droves. It was too much for the raiders, and they broke, fleeing into the sea and attempted to swim towards their leader's kingship as it set sail, but none made it. The Ropsmen either butchered them with their blades or drowned them under the cold waves. It was a bloodbath and the sands ran red. 
At last, vengeance was satisfied. However, it was to be short-lived, for soon after, some 70 years ago now, the Gospodars, led by their Khan queen, Niska, the slaughterer, invaded the land of the Ungols to the east of the Ropsmen. This forced the horsemen into the land of the Ropsmen, and they fought with the clansmen for dominance. The fight against Vegir and his Norsemen had sapped much of the strength of the Ropsmen, and the Ungols quickly gained the upper hand. The final battle saw the Ungol warlord Hethis Chak's army defeat the last Rotsman host led by King Wirin on the cliffs overlooking the Sea of Claws. This ended with the Ropsmen finally being scattered and the Ungols taking possession of their lands. This is the point at which the Ropsmen became extinct as a tribe and the survivors were either killed or absorbed into Ungol society before the Ungols themselves too fell to the Gospodars during the war that would establish the kingdom of Kislev at the turn of the century. Yet another tale for another day though. Now, it is still said that there are scattered bands of warriors in troll country who claim to be living descendants of the original Ropsmen, but who can say if this is true or not? I'd like to think it is. So Heinrich, I think that establishes who Vegir the Sacrificer was. But how did he end up in uh, Skeggy? Ah, yeah, yeah. Well, my uh, grandpapa told me that uh, after his humiliation at the hands of the Ropsmen, his reputation sank to dangerous depths, and uh, Vegir fell out of favour with the Dark Gods. Upon his return to Noska, rivals, each eager to take his head, began coming out of the woodwork. Eventually, it was just too dangerous for him to remain in Noska, and he decided to journey to uh, Skeggy and begin again in the new world. This he did, and his fortunes began to look up again as he raided up and down the uh, Lustrian coast. That was until he crossed the path of Marco Colombo.